Hello, and welcome back to an all-new episode of the unofficial Gilded Age Actor Show. I am Kelsey Paul, Manager of Interpretation and Engagement at the Frick Pittsburgh. We have a very fun group today with us. Uh, you will recognize Melanie Groves, who is our Manager of Exhibitions and Registrar. You will also recognize Morgan Lawrence. She is our Collections and Exhibitions Assistant. And we have Kelly McMasters Parsons today. She is the Coordinator of the Learning and Visitor Experience to department, but she also happens to be the producer extraordinaire of the after show. She does all of our editing, so we're excited to have her in front of the camera today. Um, as always, we have a ton to talk about, a ton to get into. We're going to try to get to as much of it as we possibly can. Uh, we will start with our episode synopsis. So we're looking at episode eight, Tucked Up in Newport. Uh, in this episode, we see Peggy reveal the truth about her past. Um, George gets his day in court and Marion considers her romantic future. Um, we're going to start in the place that the title suggests, which is Newport. We got to see Newport shine in all of its glory in this episode. Um, I was going to start by saying to our viewers, if you have not watched episode five of the after show yet, press pause, go back and watch it. We spoke with Trudy Cox, who is the executive director of the Preservation Society of Newport County, and she shared a whole bunch of really interesting behind the scenes details about Newport and its history with us. Um, but I love this episode. I love the costumes. I need to start with the costumes because the vacation wear in this episode is amazing. So many light colors, so many stripes. You have a little bit of nautical influences. Anyone else obsessed with it the way that I was obsessed with it? <laughs> so much. Yes. So all of the tennis outfits are amazing. Yes. Seeing Gladys running out there and then thinking about women and all of the corsets under all of their <laughs> vacation wear, they're not really relaxing under all of those garments. They're still tightened up and um, running around. So they're amazing though. Yeah. And it also gave me such an appreciation for having the fluidity of how our clothes are crafted now, because I really think it would be an athletic endeavor just to get into the tennis outfits that they had in the Gilded Age, let alone <laughs> having to play in them. <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about tennis in a second. I, you know, I, I'm just picturing that scene where they're lounging outside, outside of the McAllister residence. And it's clearly that they're supposed to be relaxing, but they are fully buttoned up, dressed. Ward is wearing a suit. Like everything is still, there is no, like vacation wear is not what we're picturing as vacation wear uh, by any means. But we loved the tennis costumes. We, part in particular, were really interested in the tennis because at the Frick, we very recently have had a special exhibition called Sporting Fashion, which explored uh, women's sporting costumes in this period and beyond. And we had some amazing uh, costume tennis costumes in that collection that we, we got to see. Um, I know Morgan and Melanie, you both worked with that exhibition. Talk to us a little bit about what tennis was all about in the 1880s and 1890s because it's not quite the athletic endeavor that it is nowadays at that point. <laughs> well, I think we see for sure tennis is an activity. I think similarly to the quadrille, it's an opportunity for um, ladies and young gentlemen to get together and have an activity where they can socialize and mix in a way that is acceptable and has proper supervision and a reason for them to be getting together. Um, I think it's not, <laughs> we're not thinking of Serena Williams out there um, serving, uh, serving the ball across the court. It's a little bit more fanciful and entertaining. And um, Morgan, if you have anything to add, if you've done some, some looking up on tennis, um, take it away. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, the research that I briefly conducted about tennis was just an extension of what you said. It was really a sport that originated as a leisure time activity for women to finally utilize a little bit of outdoor sport and getting out of the home in a physical way, but physical, how we think of it in terms today was not how it was portrayed back in the Gilded Age. It was supposed to be a sport that was still delicate in appearance for women and non-aggressive. And they were supposed to still 
look elegant and pretty and be a supporting role for a male partner. And so it was um, a quote that I read was stating that women were still supposed to support a man's loss within a tennis game and oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, maintain their decorum throughout the performance. So definitely different than how we would think of today playing tennis. <laughs> Yeah, I had read, you know, this idea, and I remember us learning this when we were preparing for the special exhibition we had, um, that early on in the, in women getting outside and doing sporting activities, it's not about competition. It's about getting outside, getting movement, and being healthy, um, but competitiveness is not something that is encouraged. And I read an article about tennis in particular that women were encouraged to directly hit the ball to their opponent so that it was not, <laughs> she was not being competitive. She was not trying to win. You know, it needed to be very, very buttoned up. Um, and All I, right. I like that, that version of tennis. That's one that I can <laughs> handle otherwise, not for me. Um, I'm thinking particularly of one of the ensembles that was in that exhibition, um, mm -hmm. which I think may, I don't know if that particular one informed, but it's very similar to the ones that we see in the episode. It's um, blue and white stripes. Stripes were featured in tennis mm -hmm. outfits. Um, and then this particular one, because ladies would still need to have their hat, this mm -hmm. hat of the ensemble features little tiny tennis rackets all around it. Mm -hmm. I love that detail. That was one of my favorite things in that exhibition. Yeah, I noticed a lot more stripes in this episode. It was like everyone was wearing stripes. It wasn't just when they were playing tennis. I noticed like the men were wearing stripes. It was clearly like stripes were the vacation pattern of choice. Um, did anyone else spot the very funny tennis racket case thing that Gladys was holding. If you look very closely in the background after she plays tennis, she puts her tennis racket in what it, it's like a wooden tennis case, but it's just like two pieces of wood and brackets that hold it together to protect the, to protect the racket. And I, I thought that was really funny. It's like early sporting gear <laughs> that is not what we would recognize uh, today. Um, Let's talk a little bit about the Newport Casino, though. I think all of us were really interested in that space and have been doing some reading about it. It has a very close connection to tennis. It's not a casino in the way we would probably think about a casino now. Um, it was more like a country club. I think that's a better comparison maybe to make, but it has a very close tie to tennis. It is now the home of the Tennis Hall of Fame. Uh, the first national championships of tennis, which is now the U.S. Open, was held at the Newport Casino. Um, so there's a very deep connection between Newport and tennis that I wasn't aware of before watching this show and doing some research, which I think is really cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about Mamie and Bertha. <laughs> we get to see uh, well, first of all, I love anytime we get to see Bertha interact with a new member of high society. It's always fun to watch how this goes. Um, but Mamie and Bertha in particular are sizing each other up in this episode. And I love that Bertha really keeps pace with Mamie. And I think um, she, you know, there's that moment in the dinner scene um, where she says she's persistent or something. There's something that tenacious. She, she's, she's tenacious. tenacious. That's what it is. She's tenacious. And um, it reminded me of when Mrs. Astor said that Mr. Russell was a force to be reckoned with mm -hmm. and that they took that as a compliment. Um, so I don't know. Did anyone else have reactions to Mamie and Bertha? Because I, I would honestly probably just watch the two of them like repartee across the table for a whole episode. It's another kind of tennis match, actually. You know, <laughs> you're saying that you can watch sort of back and forth. Um, I I loved watching them sort of trade half backhanded insults, maybe a little bit. But yeah. I also heard that Mamie Fish in actuality kind of liked her parties to have an aspect of that. She wasn't afraid of offending somebody and kind of enjoyed it and thought it was fun to set that apart. So that's, I don't know, that's a fun party, I think. And <laughs> hanging out at Mamie Fish's and like having her put people against each other and bring in people who are a little bit outside. I think she yeah. likes the attention of being the one who has Bertha Russell here. And she's mm. sort of, Bertha's kind of like 
a sideshow oddity to some of these people and Mamie has brought her and everyone's come to see her mm. um see how she performs yeah. I think it's Ward McAllister uh after Bertha after their first interaction while the tennis match is being held uh Bertha is worried that she offended Mamie or ruined her chances I think she says she bungled her chances mm. uh and Ward McAllister is like no I think she'll probably like you even more now <laughs> because <laughs> yeah you held your own with her and yeah. she continues to hold her own with her especially in talking about the trial it's like Mamie mm. Fish has all the current information on the trial <laughs> just as soon as Bertha does and is trying to use it to get Bertha away and Bertha just meets her for every single hit yeah I exactly. love <laughs> that she was able to like just so quickly turn it around to and ignore the trial because I was thinking I can't do like I give away everything I have no poker face so um again thinking about the casino and games people are playing that's um kind of a fun tie-in that they're pulling with this episode yeah one of the things I was thinking about because we know we've seen Larry Russell interact with Mamie before we've seen I mean right in episode one he's being invited up to her home in Newport um he seems to have a very cordial relationship with Mamie he's sitting down on the end of the table talking to her and I thought it was interesting you see a little bit of this uh societal double standard here with the way that Larry who is a Russell and who is new money has been welcomed into this group sooner than his mother has. And like you said, Bertha is still being treated like a sideshow oddity. You know, she's the, everybody wants to check her out and get, you know, figure out what's going on. But there's a comment that Bertha makes either to Aurora or someone else, you know, that she loves that Larry is really holding his own and that he's been doing this for a while. So I just think it's interesting that Larry gets the in before Bertha does. And Bertha's having to claw her way up the, up the ladder in a way that Larry doesn't seem to, even though they have the same last name, which seems like it should be affecting them the same way. Um, yeah, the relationship between Mamie Fish and Larry is weird to me actually like why is she why is why is Larry staying at Mamie Fish's house how is she picking out these young people and she's yeah. like showing them the way even from the first episode when we see her at Newport she's pulling in Carrie Astor and Oscar is there like what's going on there I don't know I don't know what those the customs reading that are I've done is that that really speaks to the very odd place that she, the real life Mamie Fish occupied in this society which is that she didn't really care about the new money old money she was just there to have a good time <laughs> and she was in a lot of ways the antithesis or the other side of the coin from Caroline Astor because she held all the same status but she didn't really care if she played by the rules or not and so I you know what I've read about her is that she did all she cared about was having a great party which is why she tended to maybe mm -hmm. gravitate towards the younger generation and she loved I think um almost playing matchmaker a little bit of being able to get these younger people in a room together and seeing, you know, how that would take off. So it sounds, it seems like it's pretty true. I mean, she just seems like a blast. I don't know. <laughs> she seems like a lot of fun. <laughs> um, speaking of the Astros though, and I want to talk a little bit about Bertha at the very end of the episode, because uh, Bertha has a real fall from grace at the end, which is kind of painful to watch. Um, we see Ward McAllister and Aurora Fain and Bertha essentially break in to Caroline, Ast Caroline Astor's home, Beechwood. Uh, they bribe the butler to be able to get in and see it ahead of time. Um, a little fun fact from our friends in Newport, um, what we see as Beechwood is an amalgam of a bunch of historic houses none of which are actually Beechwood, which is interesting. Beechwood still stands. It's in Newport, but it's privately owned. It's not open as a museum currently. So what we're seeing on the outside is actually Chateau sur Mer, which if you were paying close attention in the episode, John Adams mentions that he is staying at Chateau sur Mer with the Wetmores, which was a real family. The interior of that house that we see is another Newport mansion named Belcourt, and then at the very end, when we're seeing poor Bertha get hustled out the back door, the kitchen that we're seeing in that scene is actually Marble House, which is another historic house that belonged to the Vanderbilt. So it's it's just kind of an interesting behind the scene. Bertha is mad <laughs> at the end of that episode. I 
cannot wait to see what the other half of that is when we pick up the next episode because something tells me that she is not going to let that lie she's so mad I mean the look on her face like steam could have been coming out of her ears <laughs> when she was out there. I loved it I loved the dramatic shots from her to a fish being scaled to a chicken having its feathers plucked out to a servant smoking well, right like this is what may happen to her if Caroline Astor had found her in the house like she may have been skinned and plucked herself <laughs> Oh mm-hmm. gosh, though. I can't stop thinking about that though, which is, I cannot imagine that happening in real life. This idea that they would go to her house and even risk being seen there when Caroline is not there. Like she doesn't know that that Butler took that money, but like he, he might turn right around and tell Caroline Asper, you know, who snuck into your house when you weren't here. Like it's, it's a real risk to take. And it kind of surprises me that Bertha did it at all because she is so conscious of, you know, what she's trying to do. And she's so methodical, um, about climbing the ladder, but, um, yeah, I don't, I cannot see Bertha just moving on from that incident. Nobody puts baby in a corner and nobody pushes <laughs> Bertha out the kitchen door. <laughs> Um, the walk of shame to the carriage after we oh. see her push out the door and she's walking out to the carriage uh it's humiliating I think that kind of yeah. humiliation is what is gonna stay and drive her even forward well and I hope it becomes a connecting point to her origin story too mm. like if this was kind of a moment that she has already lived before whenever she was younger so it's not really like an unfamiliar shocking feeling to be in this setting for the first time but to be back in this setting so I'm curious to see if they'll finally give us a little bit of a hint because prior in the episode um I think it might have been Mrs. Astor who said that she came from nothing Mm -hmm. so I want to see what nothing entails (laughs) that's a really good point Morgan we I there's another episode where somebody calls her a potato digger's daughter (laughs) like isn't it Larry calls her that somebody I can't remember who but they refer to her as a potato digger's daughter so we've gotten all of these small moments where we're supposed to assume that Bertha truly did come from nothing she she comes from a sounds like much more working class background than anything else um and I think that's a really good point. She's managed to climb so far in what we think is a pretty short period of time, which I think you're right, probably adds insult to industry for her to get pushed out that kitchen door because it's like she just falls straight back down to where she started in just the blink of an eye. And speaking of her walk of shame back to the carriage, I was thinking, where is she? What What is her next step here? Because she can't go back to the carriage. She can't be seen sitting in the carriage waiting for Ward McAllister and Aurora to come out. She go walk home? Like, where is she going? <laughs> I would like to know that plot hole, Julian. How, how is she going to get home after this? Fingers crossed the next episode picks up right where we left off and we have to watch her walk home. <laughs> Just Bertha walking down a dirt road, like trying to get out McAllister's house. Um, we had a really great question from an Instagram follower. Uh, Duke 1924 asked us, what about Southern alternatives to Newport, like Jekyll Island and Cumberland Island? Um, I want to thank this follower for this question because it sent Melanie and I down some really interesting rabbit holes about vacationing in the Gilded Age. Um, I'll start with Jekyll Island and Cumberland Island. I had heard of Jekyll Island, both are in Georgia, um, and they are very similar stories to the origins of Newport. Uh, Jekyll Island was a popular hunting club, but it had patrons like JP, JP Morgan, Vanderbilts. Um, so all of the same crowd is showing up uh, in Jekyll Island, um, but in a warmer climate, you know, longer year round. Um, Cumberland Island is the same thing. I read that, you know, Carnegie's spent a lot of time in Cumberland Island. But Newport is absolutely not the only vacation spot for this group of people in the Gilded Age. Um, There's Saratoga Springs. We hear about that from Agnes. Um, There are a lot of wellness retreats, which feels so modern to us, but places like Saratoga Springs or the Greenbrier in West Virginia, um, they came about because they had natural springs that were touted as having health benefits. So the resort towns built, built out of that. And Melanie, I know you've done 
done some research on Pride's Crossing, Massachusetts, which is where the Frick family had their summer home, um, and that there's a whole sort of other story to Pride's Crossing that even we were not really aware of before you did some digging. Yeah, so um, Pride's Crossing is part of Boston's North Shore, which was sort of an alternative to Newport, um, but with a much calmer vibe. Um, and the Fricks move in a little bit later than uh, we're seeing Newport, sort of Newport's coming to its peak during the Gilded Age TV show, TM. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the Fricks move to Pride's Crossing and they build their summer cottage or their summer home, Eagle Rock, um, it's constructed between 1904 and they open in 1906. Um, other people who were building places in Pride's Crossing were presidents, politicals, um, a lot of literaries and artists were there. H.J. Hines also had a place there and I believe Carnegie. So there's a Pittsburgh contingent there as well. Um, the Fricks traveled there on their private railroad car, the Westmoreland. So um, it's a well connected to Pittsburgh via the railway, um, but Frick, there's a whole chapter in this book that I was reading, the North Shore, that's called um, Look Out, Mr. Frick's Coming. So he's sort of posed as the same, their family is posed as the same, moving into this old Boston uh, resort area as the Russells. And I read some reports, um, Frick ends up building the grandest mansion on the North Shore or even north of Newport, it's reported. Um, the fence that he builds for the property alone is $100,000 in then money. So um, Mrs. Astor bought her house for $200,000. Frick is spending half of that just for the fence. So um, really building something spectacular and, and amazing. I forget exactly how many rooms are at Eagle Rock. Kelsey, it's, do you have that? It's over 100. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's big. It's big. Um, <laughs> super, super lush, um, just so that he can take in the waters. One of those things, everybody's coming from urban, mm. um, you know, the Fricks and the Russells are not living in densely populated areas, but still getting out to the sea. Um, we see lots of industrialists building properties in Florida, um, traveling for health and to take in sea air and the waters. Um, one interesting thing about Frick's property was he didn't have uh, shorefront. Uh, he had about a 15 foot easement through an old Boston family's property and he tried to buy that property so he could have some beachfront for a million dollars then money um, from the daughter of one of the old Boston families and she said eh, what would I do with a million dollars so he didn't get his beachfront which I kind of love in this story. That was some shade from <laughs> from that young woman who Nah, I'm, I'm good. Um, we have really great photos of the Frick family in Pride's Crossing um, at the beach. I I love I love old timey like 19th century beach wear. It's the most ridiculous, <laughs> not practical clothing. And I love the the old photos of the Frick family um, spending time in, in Pride's Crossing and doing the kinds of things that we were seeing, you know, the the characters do in Newport. We didn't get any beach scenes uh, in 1882 in the show, but uh, maybe we will eventually. But yeah, they're doing all of those same things. It's about getting out and it's about getting away. Um, but we, we heard some really interesting points in the show about Newport not being a relaxing place. And there are conversations about that becoming even more so once the Astors move in. This idea that when Mrs. Astor shows up on the scene, it's not going to be relaxing. I love Mrs. McAllister's shade um, <laughs> at Caroline Astor as, and her sort of annoyance that Mrs. Astor is going to come and ruin the vibe in Newport. And um, so... So yeah, Newport is, is not the only vacation spot on the scene. It is maybe the most famous, but it's definitely not the only one. Um, the coolest thing about most of these resorts and resort towns is that they still exist and that you can actually go stay. So we were talking, we're going on vacation. We're going to go, <laughs> we're going to go on tour of some Gilded Age <laughs> hotels. <laughs> Check Let us out. know you want a YouTube series on all of the hotels. We have there to visit go. them. <laughs> We have to do a profile. We'll create Reviews. a new series. There's, there you go. There's the next version <laughs> of the after show. Um, let's switch gears a little bit, though. One of the other really interesting dynamics that we see in Newport is this new phase in the relationship between Oscar Van Ryn 
and John Adams. Uh, we have seen that relationship through the course of this first season, um, but we are seeing some tension between the two of them that we haven't really seen. And it all sort of comes to a head when John kind of crashes uh, the weekend in Newport and shows up unannounced. But we wanted to unpack this relationship between them a little bit because it's a really interesting part of history and it's worth talking about. Um, let's talk a little bit, and I know Melanie and Kelly, you've done a lot of research on this. Let's talk a little bit about what same-sex relationships would have been up against in dealing with in the 19th century. What is a relationship like Oscar and John's going to come up against in terms of society and what would have been scandalous or acceptable for them? I have to say this is one of the most heartbreaking relationships in the series for me. Um, I'm having a hard time watching it. We've talked so much about, you know, Gladys's mm. love life and how sad it is that she has not had the opportunity to find a person that she loves and Archie was pulled away from her. Um, but this is also a very similar situation where Oscar is trying to set himself up for, you know, I think he wants a pretty lavish future, but he's trying to set himself up in society in New York to continue. Um, we don't know how much money he's going to inherit. I don't think it's that much. He says he's living on a banker's salary, so he has to do something. And uh, just watching it unfold has been, um, I don't know, it's been hard to watch. And it just reminds me of, we talked very early in the series about how precarious women were in this in, in this time period, how pre precarious their situations were, they needed to depend on um, a man and their wealth and their ability to move within business. And Oscar is not that different. You know, his situation is he needs to find a marriage. He's not able to just live his life. So I don't know. This was a storyline I really wanted to look at. And it, they're giving Oscar some villain vibes too, which I'm yes. kind of like, eh, um, I don't love that. Uh, you know, he's got enough already. So um, I don't know, Kelly, what are your thoughts? Yeah. You know, I definitely get the villain vibes as well. We were talking before about how Oscar and Turner being together, they feel like just like a pair of villains, uh, particular, they just like their costumes are a little bit different and they, they just look different. Um, but I think, you know, we're watching this, of course, from 2022, a very different lens than what they may have had at the time. And so I think we're seeing two examples of how um, homosexuality, uh, particularly in men, would be dealt with. Uh, you have John, who I think is truly in love with Oscar and would be yeah. happy to live this kind of semi-closeted life where they can still kind of go into public together because it's not weird for two men to be eating at a restaurant together. Um, but you know, they, they can't be married or anything or share their lives. Um, but then you have Oscar who is very aware of the fact that he needs to keep that image, you know, as much as he sort of talks down to his mother for being so focused on image, he is clearly very invested in his own image and, uh, keeping up the appearance of straightness and the wealth. Um, I think maybe it's a little bit more about the wealth with Gladys than it is about marrying a woman um, because, you know, he could have his pick of probably many people being an old money family. Um, but interestingly, in the late 19th century is when we see sort of a changing view of homosexuality and sort of the advent of that term. Um, so a lot of times when you're discussing uh, queer history, you know, it's, it's the, we can't put a name to it, that term didn't exist, but this is a time of transition really for that. Uh, prior to this, you know, it's, it's criminal, um, it's really like religiously based that you're going to think that same-sex actions are a sin. Um, but as science kind of takes over from the clergy as being sort of your authority morally and intellectually, uh, you have sort of medical journal journals and medical cases of homosexuality and men going to doctors saying, I'm having these same sex attractions. What's going on with me? What can we do about this? And you have this sort of very scientific approach to it that is very different, I think, than what we think of today. Uh, very different than what they thought in the early 19th century and the 18th century. 
you know, before then, you know, when we think about the Greeks and, and mm. these sort of ancient places where gay men were more common, it was more about just everything was fluid. You didn't put a tag on it. You didn't say, uh, you're a gay man, but late 19th century, we're starting to say those things. Um, and there is, there is this growing sort of clinicalization, if that's a word of, of homosexuality. Um, but there are also lots of men who are like, this is not new. This is mm -hmm. not a new phenomenon. We're here. We're just kind of underground. And I know Melanie, you had also seen, uh, there were sort of dive bars in New York at this time. The slide is one that we, we mm -hmm. discussed before we recorded today. Um, I've also read about, I think it's called the excise, um, in New York, uh, were sort of these dive yeah. bars that you had to know about to get into it, you know modern audiences we can think of stonewall um someplace where men would go to be around similar men and you had to know the right things the right way to act to sort of be known by another another gay man just to read um about the active scene at the time it wouldn't be you know unusual that Oscar and John could go somewhere. There were places they could go. And I was, um, I was excited to read about some historic, uh, historic walking tours you can take in New York. So there's one by, um, there's the Village Pride tour and there's also the Oscar Wilde tours where you can join and they'll take you to some of the clubs. I think there are landmarks that are still standing and you can learn about um, the LGBT history of New York and sort of see it for yourself and, and go there. Um, really interesting places. And I think these two particular ones look like they have some good history behind them. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Oscar Wilde. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, can we see some similarities between I Oscar think, Wilde I don't, and Listeners, viewers, <laughs> yes. If you agree, let me know. I think that Oscar Van Ryan has a lot of similarities to Oscar Wilde. Um, Oscar Wilde is a little younger than Oscar Van Ryan. His sort of active era um, is a little bit later, maybe. Actually, we were discussing earlier, we're not totally sure how old everybody on the Gilded Age is, so <laughs> yeah. who knows. Um, but Oscar Wilde, very famously um, queer, let's not put a label on it. I think, you know, I think he had attractions to men and to women. He was a big pioneer of the aestheticism movement. So he's into beauty and he had long hair and he wore fabulous clothing, which I think Oscar, Oscar wears very different clothing than everyone else in the show. Mm -hmm. His suits are a little bit fancier. He has those sunglasses in that one episode, his sunglasses. different hats. Um, but Oscar Wilde very famously had a relationship with a gentleman named Lord Alfred Douglas and Douglas's father, uh, went to call on Oscar Wilde and on the calling card uh, identified Oscar Wilde as a sodomite, which is a gay man. Uh, and this equated to publicly outing Oscar. So Oscar sues his boyfriend's dad. And that leads to a very public revealing of Oscar Wilde's uh, relationship with this man. Um, Wilde ends up dropping the case, but then gets arrested for being, uh, gay and queer um, and he's in prison for a couple years at the end of the 19th century um, interestingly he recently was pardoned in 2017 in the united kingdom they pardoned many men who were uh, convicted on sodomy charges um, but i think i think let me know viewers if you agree but i think oscar wilde in name and in personality is quite an inspiration for oscar van ryan well, and I think, you know, pointing out some of those similarities or at least pointing out the details of, of the story of someone like Oscar Wilde does speak to what Oscar or John's concerns would be about having the ambiguity of their relationship dropped. So we talked before the episode and, and Morgan, I know you read a couple of articles about this idea that what defined a male friendship or a male relationship in the 19th century looked very different than what it looked like, what looks like now or in the 20th century. Um, it wasn't weird for men to be close. It wasn't weird for them to write affectionate letters to each other. And, you know, some things that I had read was that 
in the 19th century, there's a willingness to turn a blind eye to a male friendship or a, or a female friendship, um, as long as it's ambiguous, as long as there's nothing overt that, you know, society can point to and say, this is unacceptable, or this is going too far. Um, there's a lot of leeway there. And so we talked about that moment in the restaurant when John says just a little bit too loud that he loves Oscar and Oscar has that moment where he wants to sort of shut it all down that's the kind of fear that would have been there that if the wrong person at the wrong time hears something like that there could be real ramifications for your life and you know yeah the criminality of it is changing in the late 19th century but there is still that fear in that time period of what could happen to you if you know someone made an accusation like that and it crossed over into slander which I think is what Oscar is probably really concerned about. So we're going to switch gears totally again. <laughs> I don't have a good segue from that topic to this topic, but we did also want to talk about Peggy. That's the, she is the other uh, very big plot point in this episode. We've had this very drawn out storyline of the fact that Peggy has a secret. She has a secret. Tom Rakes is involved and we're going to talk about Tom in a second too. Um, <laughs> but we'll start with Peggy. Um, Due to some conniving on the part of Armstrong, Peggy is forced to finally share with Agnes and Marion what the truth of her situation is. We find out that not only was she married prior to coming back to New York City, um, but she also had a baby. Um, she tells Marion really tragically that she lost her baby, um, that she almost lost her own life, you know, in childbirth. Um, and so she has this really tragic back story that I think we've been getting allusions to, but we haven't seen what that really is. We now know that is really the root of the fractured relationship between her and her father, because her father is the one who um, sort of took the reins and annulled her marriage uh, and, you know, forced her to kind of come back and, you know, forget her child, she says. Um, but we wanted to talk about this because Peggy is representing a really, um, real story for a lot of women in this time period um, with high rates of infant mortality. It is absolutely something that women experienced. Um, and the fact that the medicine ha had not really caught up um, this idea, you know, she talks about this, this midwife who she wants to find to be able to get more information about her child. That's absolutely what most women's experiences would have been. Male doctors as attendants in birth are just starting to be a thing in the 19th century. Most women giving birth would have been attended by a midwife or more likely than not just female family members or friends or neighborhood women who would come and help. Um, but of course the, the casualty rate, the mortality rate is really, really high, not just for the baby, but for the woman as well. Um, and, you know, something that we've all talked about is that, uh, you know, for all of the wealth that we see on the show, The Gilded Age, or, you know, that we talk about in the Fricks experience, um, the Fricks lost children as well. Um, they lost uh, two children. And so, you know, in this time period for all of the wealth disparity, um, that, you know, all the money in the world wouldn't necessarily save you from, from going through something like that, though you were much more likely to lose your life as a woman or to lose your child in childbirth if you were poorer because you weren't given the, you didn't have as much of an opportunity to have the best care um, or, or anything like that. So, I mean, Peggy's story is absolutely heartbreaking. And I think it's even more heartbreaking to realize the historical reality of her story um, in that way. And I, you know, I don't know if anyone else has any other things they wanted to add, but that was kind of my reaction to it. The one thing that I'm thinking of just as you talk is that it's not that different today. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about the the racial implications and as well as the um, economic situations, you know, the just thinking the poorer you are, the less money you have, the less access to healthcare you have, and the immense amount of bias in the healthcare system. Somebody like Peggy today may have the same experience the mortality rates and um black women as well as their children are much higher than those for white women now so you know we still have a long way to go yeah in, in fixing this issue yeah absolutely um now i know some of us have questions about 
whether or not we, so we have this mystery still surrounding um, Peggy's child a little bit. We, we, she talks about the fact that she wasn't able to find the midwife who supposedly delivered her baby. Some of us think that perhaps there's a chance that her baby did not pass away, um, which I'm sort of hopeful for. I hope that maybe that's the case and that she'll be able to be reunited with her child potentially. I know there's also this idea of, yeah, what what happens to an unwed mother, for example, mm-hmm. you know, that I mean, that was one of the things that I'm interested to hear you guys take a take on it because you know, Peggy, it's clear that she has a lot of shame with what happened to her, but she was a married woman. She was having a child with her husband. Um, and you know, it's, so it's different in a way than some of the story that we heard, we've heard about like Mrs. Chamberlain, for example, there's a lot of, you know, questions and, you know, rumors about the paternity of Mrs. Chamberlain's son, but that's not the case for Peggy, but you know, yeah, there, there's definitely context for women who gave birth, who were not able to keep their children or couldn't take care of their children, or it was a scandal for them to have their children. And these children would end up in various places being raised by family members or, you know, whoever. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting plot point. I was interested to see this be her, her secret. I had a feeling that it probably had something to do with a love life decision or potentially a child, but it was interesting to see that play out finally and um, see what the secret was that she has been carrying around. Um, the other thing we can talk about is um, Marion's story, which kind of ties in with Peggy, because of course we find out that Peggy was married. She eloped with her husband to go to Philadelphia without her family's permission. And this is a decision that Marion is considering and whether or not she would want to elope with Tom Rakes. Uh, We got a fantastic question from an Instagram follower, Mia Flowen. She wants to know, is Marion being duped? And I am going to take a poll right now. Morgan, is Marion being duped? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, I, is Marion being duped? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Melanie, what do you think? <laughs> I'll go with it. I'm going to go with no. I don't know. We talked about this. I don't know what's in it for Tom. Theory. What's in it for Tom? You've convinced me, I guess, for the viewers, we'll reveal it. What is in this for Tom? Because Marion, as far as we know, she has nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Van Rhyne fortune, whatever's left of it after Agnes lives forever, as Oscar <laughs> fears that she will, is destined for Oscar. It's also holding up Ada. So what does, I don't, Tom is already making his way into society. Mm. He doesn't really need Marion. So I don't, why would, what is he duping her for, I guess, is my question. I have a theory, which I will share in a second, but Morgan, why do you think she's being duped? What are, what is your reaction that makes you feel like she's being duped? I feel like it's just the way that his character is being portrayed Mm -hmm. and all of these little nuggets of information about him being everywhere in society and his rise is happening so quickly, especially with the comment made by Mrs. Fain, Mm -hmm. as far as this like back hallway warning to Marion. And in my mind, I'm thinking there are so many ways that the screenwriters and scripters could have portrayed this interaction between Tom Rakes of all things for a last name and Marion. And they chose to make it a little bit precarious. And I feel like he is just using her and I'm team Marion and Larry. (laughs) (laughs) That I can get behind. Yeah, I do. Like like Larry for (laughs) Marion. I feel like when I was watching the first episode, I texted Kelsey and said, Marion and Larry are going to get together because they really set it up. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, we're all hashtag team Larian, (laughs) uh, putting the couple name into the universe. Um, Tom is just a sneaky, a sneaky man. I was going to say, thank you, Pumpkin, for that. Oh, yes. Pumpkin Pumpkin brings them together. (laughs) Pumpkin is the ultimate matchmaker, which like, a dog is the ultimate meat cue. That's pumpkin. how that happens all the time. <laughs> um, so I, I do have a theory, which I'll share, share in a second. I, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this and Morgan, your point about, they just, 
they make him seem like it's just a little off like he's in too many of the right places at the right time clearly a lot of the characters in the show don't really trust him and, and you know aurora in particular mrs fane definitely seems to have her eye on him and think that something weird is happening there i think you could sum that up to just say well that's just the old money distrusting a outsider like the fact that he's an outsider but when you really look into the progression of his relationship with Marion, he is also doing all of the wrong things at every turn. So just like anything else in the Gilded Age, marriage and courtship have, has a lot of stringent expectations and rules for how this is supposed to go for a well-to-do couple. Um, one of the things is the courting process always should be supervised. It needs to either be in public or with a chaperone. There are a lot of rules that navigate you know, unmarried men and women spending time together. We've seen that be flouted on many an occasion by Marion at Tom often at Tom's insistence, like Tom is often the one, not always, but he's usually the one that sort of initiates those conversations. Um, his proposal in the park is absolutely outside of what he should have done or would have been expected to do. He would have been expected to te uh, speak to, in this case, Agnes and Ada to get permission from them prior to asking. Um, the expectation is also that you would do it potentially in front of family members or in front of friends. So the fact that he does this like in public in the park, it's very unexpected. Um, Marion also doesn't do really what she's supposed to do, which is that she's supposed to give a pretty quick, polite answer. <laughs> she's not supposed to string him along, which she kind of has for several episodes. But my theory about what could be the motivation for why Tom uh, would be pursuing Marion in this way is that perhaps Tom has not been forthright about Marion's financial situation. The only person who we know in the show knows that Marion has no money is Tom. He's the one that tells her that her father hasn't left her any money um, and that she's in this terrible way. I think it's not the craziest theory in the world that perhaps that is not true. Perhaps he did leave money to Marion. And so this is kind of a long con on Tom's part and that he's trying to get in with Marion, um, make her believe that he just wants to marry her because he loves her and he knows she has no money when in reality, once he gets his hooks in her, perhaps he then would say, surprise, you've been sitting on a giant pile of money. I don't know. Um, but I think that's the only context in which this whole thing makes sense. Because Melanie, I think you're right. It otherwise his pursuit of her in this way doesn't make a ton of sense if she has no money to offer him. Yeah, I could see, like, I don't trust him. I see what you guys are saying. However, <laughs> you know, I thought he was using her within New York society. She was, a, you know, a token in his game to make it there and get his himself set up there. But now he seems to be almost taking off without her. So I was surprised actually in this episode that he was so insistent on marrying her because I thought she was just, you know, something he was playing with or she was an end, an end to a means, mm -hmm. a means, a means to an end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right because he in a lot of ways has surpassed her in terms of his social connections at this point. So he doesn't really need her beyond this. I really thought the same thing that I think Mrs. Fane thought, which is after that carriage tailgating thing, he had met that other uh, woman whose name I forgot that who did come from money. I thought that was going to be the moment where he ditched Marion and said, oh, I've met this other lady, mm -hmm. but instead he doubled down and now he's pushing the elopement. Um, which, you know, eloping another, well, just as a wrapping this conversation up, I found some very fun and interesting articles about uh, this rash of elopements in the last couple of decades of the 1880s and the 1890s. There was a lot of press coverage of this idea that there was a rise in the number of not only young couples that were choosing to elope without their parents' permission, but also 
people who were already in married relationships leaving their families and going off and getting married to other people. Um, and it's a really interesting idea that there would have suddenly been this, this uptick in something like that. Um, you know, this younger generation, perhaps, you know, bucking against their parents' generation of Victorian, you know, social morals. Um, but I also read an interesting point from a historian that said that it might not have been that there were actually more uh, elopements in that period. It's just that perhaps the press suddenly took notice of it. So it's not that there's more elopements, there were just more articles covering it, which makes it seem like there were maybe more um, going on. But I don't know, we will see. I cannot wait. I hope we get a, I hope we get an answer to is Tom shady or not um, in the next mm. episode. Our Instagram followers also think that he cannot be trusted, I would like to say. <laughs> he's very, he's very set on getting married before Agnes approves, you know, like yes. she'll come around after the marriage. So you're right. He does have something. That's He's a red gonna... flag. <laughs> it's a red flag. I and I truly believe that Agnes has an amazing like radar on people. <laughs> like she, I, Agnes strikes me as the type that she will size you up really quickly, and she is not wrong. And she doesn't trust Tom as far as she can throw him. So I'm gonna believe Aunt Agnes on this one, but I can't wait to see uh, how it how it goes down. Um, any final thoughts from you guys before we wrap things up on the episode? We could we could keep talking forever, I think. <laughs> but I'll we- say I'm so irritated that Agnes got rid of well, let Peggy go. Yeah, let Peggy leave instead of getting rid of Armstrong. Yeah, agreed. Ugh. I was really hoping that wasn't going to be the case. But that's that's one where Aunt Agnes is a no 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 thank yeah. you. I think it does speak, you know, her reasoning is that she can't, she's too old to train another lady's maid, which feels like a throwaway excuse, but it does speak a little bit to what we talked about in the last episode of the after show of this relationship between a lady's maid and a woman like Agnes, that it is a really intimate relationship. She clearly has had Armstrong with her for a very long time. Um, I agree though. Should have kicked. Armstrong to the curb no one likes her you really get that impression everybody (laughs) like Ada other people that work downstairs are just like she's the worst (laughs) I think the the rest of the staff will turn on her (laughs) go ahead Morgan (laughs) oh I just was gonna say I thought it was a great connecting point though that we could finally see Ada coming into her own and showing that she is extremely observant so intelligent and Mm -hmm. how she's just saying what is on her mind the filter that a lot of these gilded age women are forced to have 24 7 is finally waning a little bit and she was the real hero of this episode for me with her commentary (laughs) (laughs) I think so too I think that's a good point like you get the sense from Ada that she is a little more reserved, but I think you're right. We're learning that it's not that she's not paying attention or that she's mousy in that way. She's just sitting back watching everything unfold and she's taking all of it in. Um, and yeah, I've loved her watching her open up a little bit, particularly towards Marion. I love their relationship that she seems to be the one more than maybe anybody else who is willing to tell Marion like it is. Um, so I'm interested to see, I think Ada is going to be the one that probably figures out what Marion is thinking about doing with this elopement sooner than anyone else. And I, I'm interested to see how that plays out between the two of them, because I think Ada really very clearly cares about Marion and wouldn't want her to make a mistake. Um, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be exciting though. We have one more episode left. The season finale is next week, which is exciting. Um, Of course, then we'll have season two, but I'm very excited to see how season one wraps up. Um, Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers who have been tuning in for all of these episodes so far. We will, of course, be back for one more episode. Our after show season finale will drop next Friday. Um, So we hope to see you there. Uh, Of course, you can follow us on Instagram at FrickTGH, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any of our episodes of the after show Um, but until next week thank you for watching and we hope to see you next time